Oh, hi there. You just caught me playing my favourite video game of all time. Chronic, the Sledge Blog. I just love that little blue ball of memes. Do you guys hear something? Oh. You know, I think I need a break from the blast processing for a while. <sighs> Maybe go with something more analog. Now, if only there was a non-digital way of experiencing my favourite spiky mammal-based video games. Fuck you. <laughs> No, I am of course talking about this series of Sonic the Hedgehog Adventure game books, published in the UK in the mid-90s by Puffin. If you've been to my channel before, then you know how much I love game books. I mean, come on, I already did like two other videos about it. Plug, plug! Due to being into the idea of D&D style games but not having any friends growing up, I spent many hours of my life playing adventure game books. We've already talked about the Goosebumps books and how awesome they were, and of course the legend that is fighting fantasy but there was one other gamebook series I name dropped in my Fighting Fantasy video. While there were some more obscure, interesting ones, like the Nintendo-based books, while I was growing up, I may have been more into Sonic for video games, oh, ho, ho, Sega forever! But for some reason, I was given a Mario Adventure gamebook. Being such a massive fan of Sonic, I couldn't believe it when I was researching this weird Sonic backstory I remembered, to discover that not only were there Sonic Adventure gamebooks, but they were actually published exclusively in the UK, meaning they probably had the same weird UK canon that we had in our novels. In fact, these first two books were written by one of the people behind those novels. As you can probably guess, these books put you in the shoes of Sonic himself, occasionally with his psychic tales. You have to do battle against Dr. Robotnik to save the day, and make lots of 90s references on the way. There are actually six books in this series. I own the first five. Metal City Mayhem, Zone Rangers, Sonic vs. Zonic, The Zone Zapper, and Theme Park Panic. There's also a sixth book called Storming Sonic, but it's a fair bit more expensive and hard to find than the previous five. As with my Goosebumps review, I plan on reviewing the first five Sonic game books because they're the ones I have access to. So let's jump straight in with Sonic Adventure Game Book 1, Metal City Mayhem. Metal City Mayhem is the first book in the series, and tells the story of an evil city that appears out of nowhere near the Green Hill Zone. One day, Sonic is playing his SEGA GAME GEAR. Pfft, advertise much? This was actually a relatively common theme in the British version of the Sonic canon, in the novels especially. As I said, the guy who wrote this, James Wallace, was the same guy who wrote a couple of those novels, and in one of the ones he did write, Sonic in the Fifth Dimension, the same thing happens, it starts out with Sonic playing a Game Gear. Either way, Sonic is stuck on his game, and goes to ask his friend, Porker Harris, who is a pig, for his advice on how to beat the level. When he arrives in the Green Hill Zone, he discovers that everyone is missing, and the entire zone has been completely wrecked. Following some tracks, he comes across his best friend Tails being attacked by robots and saves him. Then the two come across a giant city that has sprung up out of nowhere, called Robotopolis. Once inside, the two must save their other friends and foil the mysterious villain who is running the city, and... It's Robotnik. It's supposed to be a surprise, but it's robotic, and you can tell it's robotic. A, because it's Sonic, and Sonic is always fighting Robotnik. And B, the city is called Robotopolis! The first book in the series lays out the basic version of the mechanics which are used with very little variation throughout the other game books. Unlike Goosebumps, you actually do have stats and combat, rather than just going to a random entry. However, unlike the Fighting Fantasy series, you don't roll your stats. You're basically given several stat values. 1-5, 1-4, 1-3, and 3-2s. You can then place these different values into the six different stats. Hmm. The stats you get to choose from are a bit of a uh, mixed bag. 
Some of them make sense, like speed and agility. I mean, it's Sonic. He's supposed to be fast and, I guess, agile. But some of the rest of them are just a bit out of place. Coolness sort of makes sense, even if it's a little bit cringy. Sonic was always supposed to be a cool character after all, and it was the 90s. Things were just... different. But good looks and strength are just... weird. Sonic wasn't ever really depicted as a good looking character, outside of DeviantArt, and neither was he particularly strong. That was more of a Knuckles thing, although Knuckles didn't exist at this point, so... Blah. Either way, you select your stats, and during the course of the book, you have to test them by rolling a d6, adding your stat value, and trying to beat a score that the book will provide. Combat is also featured in the book, and works almost exactly the same way. The only difference being that if you're accompanied by Tails during combat, he adds 3 to your overall score. Obviously, since this is a Sonic game, you also have to collect rings, and you have a limited number of lives which can be increased if you collect 100 of them. A uh, 100 rings, not 100 lives. Obviously. You also have an inventory, which is important, because there are items that you flat out need to have if you want to beat the game. The only issue with the rings thing is that you're very unlikely to get 100 to generate a new life with. They come in pretty small amounts, and you're probably going to take a hit at some point. It's not like you even get to recollect any of them once you take a hit. One of the most interesting aspects of Metal City Mayhem is just how much like a video game it really is. As you progress through the book, moving through the city and saving your friends, you'll probably lose a life at some point. When you do, you're told to go back to a certain entry to try again, and this ends up really being a stroke of genius. In fact, this sort of life system would actually make other game books better in many cases. If you're not an avid player of adventure game books, then you probably don't know, but they used to rely on randomness just a little bit too much, and that could be frustrating, especially when they're tough as nails. Think back to the first Final Fantasy book, Walk of Firetop Mountain. That ends with a maze, and that's already a difficult book without the randomness being thrown in. The life system in this book really helps. It means that you have more chances to try out different things without having to just start over or straight up cheat. Which I will remind you. I mean, I, mean, I, I never, I never, I never cheated. I never cheated. I, I didn't cheat. Anyway, back to the book. Like I said, you have to journey through the Metal City, saving your friends and gathering resources so that you can take down the big boss at the end. Along the way, you meet some interesting characters. And when I say interesting... Uh, okay, so if you've seen the latest Sonic movie, you'll know that the character of Sonic is kind of deeply seated in the culture of the 90s, and, well, that's never more present than with this character. He is a rat who raps, and his name is Boombox. The 90s call, they want their everything back. Once you've rescued some friends, and collected enough lives and rings, the city is revealed to be a giant fucking robot. That's right, this gamebook ends with you having to fight a giant robot. And it's awesome! You basically have to climb up the robot, then keep trying to beat up Robotnik without falling off. If you do fall off, you have to climb back up again, which entails going through the same section of book you already did, but at least you get to have another crack at the boss, giving you more chances to beat the book. Metal City Mayhem is actually pretty cool for the first in a series of game books, but some of the entries in here are a bit... weird. One of the best endings is where Sonic accidentally clones himself, and then just sort of assumes that he's a clone, and lets the others go off to finish the adventure for him. It's really strange, but I love it. The book also makes some canon decisions that are a bit off-putting. For instance, at the start of the book, Robotnik's previous attempt at taking over Mobius are mentioned, and it seems like there are rusting spike traps left over all of the Green Hill Zone. Clearly, Sonic and his mates are really lazy when it comes to cleaning up the place they live. The book also mentions the music from the Sonic games, like it's something that actually happens in-universe, which is frankly terrifying. Sort of makes more sense that Robotnik wants to take over the world just to put a stop to that shit. To clarify, I'm not saying the music in Sonic's bad. I love the Sonic music, I listen to it while I'm working, but holy crap would that get annoying if it was just all the time. Just everywhere. The book also seems to really have it out for Sally Acorn. In one ending, she's dropped from a huge ledge and gets hurt pretty badly, and in another she literally chokes to death, which is a bit next level. James Wallace also refers to her as a babe, so I can comfortably blame him for the sexualization of the character from this point onwards. The last thing to talk about with this first gamebook is the art, and it's actually pretty decent. Although it does use the western design for Sonic, meaning that the spines are separated from his body, kind of like a mohawk or something, and I always thought that was weird. 
There's also artwork throughout the book too, and I've got to say it's welcome. In the Goosewimps book, the lack of artwork was probably my biggest criticism. Here you get to see a lot of really decent art. If you're going to play Metal City Mayhem, I highly recommend putting the 5 into your speed stat. Not only does it make the most sense, you know, from a canon perspective, it's Sonic, but also you need it for the final encounter. I also recommend putting the 5 and the 3 into Agility and Quick Wits, and this is a common theme throughout all of the other books too, for the most part. Metal City Mayhem is actually a pretty decent game book, and it's got a lot of that cheesy 90s energy that Sonic is famous for. Just don't go in expecting a nuanced story or advanced mechanics and you'll have a good time. And the best part is that the next book, Zone Rangers, also written by James Wallace, is pretty good too. The story of Zone Rangers has Sonic and Tails teleporting all over Mobius to try and save people from the corrupting influences of the Chaos Emeralds. The biggest change mechanically from the first book, other than the fact that they spelt it good looks rather than cool looks this time, is that Sonic and Tails actually have separate stats. The reason for this is because the two get separated and have their own adventures throughout the course of the book this time. It's an nice change of pace, and it allows Tails to be a separate character, rather than just clinging onto Sonic the whole time. There's also not really an overarching narrative. Robotnik sort of just gives up on his plans to take over the planet without much input from the heroes at all. The adventure this time around is much more brutal, but there's also a lot of references to the different zones from the video games, with some slight variations that are a bit off. The Scrap Brain Zone, for example, is called Scrap Brain City. There are some cool moments here too. Sonic has to help lead a revolution at one point, which is a bit like the Sonic Sat AM TV series. There's also this arsey monkey who has a go at Tails for calling her a boy, seconds after he saves her life from a fucking ravine. He also calls the monkey Young Lad, which is a bit weird when you think that Tails is actually like four or six years old or something at this point. The book also mentions the Sonic 1 special zones and calls them Warps of Confusion, which is probably the most apt name for anything ever. If there's one problem with this book, it's that it's way harder than the first one. I got through the first one on my first try. Not hard at all. But it took me five attempts to get through this one, and I still managed to end the game with no rings because I fell from space. Still one, though. The book also seems to struggle with accurately tracking the Chaos Emeralds that you've collected. Probably because there are various opportunities for you to drop them or to have not collected them at all in the first place. It also seems to forget about the live system at various points throughout the game. For instance, there is this moment when you're piloting a downed ship on a lake and it just says game over with no options to go back to a certain page. Once again, the artwork in this book is pretty decent, especially the colour, but there is a couple of weird things here, like Tails' face and, well, Robotnik's pose in general. Just like the first book, Zone Rangers is a pretty decent game book, uh, especially considering it's just a licensed tie-in for a popular video game. Having said that, the cracks have started to appear by this point, but I feel like there's something that bears mentioning. Both of these books were produced in about two months each, while the writer was working a full-time job on the side. Or I suppose these would be on the side, not the point. The point is, these were produced really quickly, and they're quite good considering that they were both done in two months. How do I know all of this, you may ask? Well, I was a cheeky little bitch and decided to email James Wallace after I read these two books, and he very, very kindly recorded some audio for me to use. So I had no part in the licensing. I had no part in, in acquiring the license. That was all Puff and Fantel. And they came to me and they said, this deal might happen. That was it. They hadn't got the license at that point. They were looking into it. They were still working through the contracts. And so I went, oh, this, this sounds really exciting. Um, I'll, you know, I won't do anything until I get the deal because this is going to be quite a chunk of work. And nothing happened, and nothing happened, and so I took a job. I I um I just I just finished my journalism postgrad at what was the London College of Printing and Distributive Trades, and is now the London College of Communication uh, at Elephant and Castle, uh, where bizarrely I've done I've done guest lectures recently. I, I was a university lecturer until recently. Um, anyway, so I took a job. Um, working full-time on a magazine. And almost immediately I started that, of course, puffing phone up and go, the deal's through, we've signed the contract, get cracking on the books. So um, so I had to write, this is the other thing, quite often when you get a deal to write licensed books like this, they will have spent months negotiating the contract, leaving you weeks to write the book. Uh, or books in this case. So I had to do these two books. I think each one was, might have had two months. I think it was two months per book, basically. I had to deliver 
the two, but I was working full time. Both of these books were produced before Sonic really even had a canon. In fact, James Wallace had to run out and get a Mega Drive and a copy of the first game just so he'd understand what was going on. Number two wasn't even out yet, and yet he had to include Tails in both of these stories. I had not played Sonic before this deal came through. In fact, one of the first things when the contract was actually signed that I did was rush out and buy a Mega Drive, which of course I could justify at that point because it's a business expense. So I could write it off against tax. I recommend this as a way of buying games consoles if you ever get the chance. Um, Sonic 2 had not come out at that point because as part of the process, I was invited over to... I can't remember if it was Sega headquarters or Sega's PR company's headquarters. It was not the huge building in West London. It was in West London, but it was a much smaller building. Um, and I got to play a little bit of Sonic 2, which was running off basically a, a prototype cartridge. Um, and you could literally, it was, you know, this was not a smooth molded plastic thing. This was a breadboarded circuitry. The chips were visible. Um, my goodness, I wish I'd stolen it. Considering how quickly he had to produce them, I think that James Wallace did a really excellent job with these game books. And if you're interested in hearing the rest of that audio, I will be uploading it to my second channel, with James's permission. He talks more about the novels he wrote and how he actually came to be writing these books in the first place. So, you know, it's interesting if you're a Sonic fan. Anyway, continuing. Next up, we have Sonic v Zonic and the Zone Zapper. Lots of Zs. Both written by the crack team of Nigel Gross and John Sutherland. I'm not 100% sure why there are two writers this time, but there's definitely a bit of a difference in tone, style, and unfortunately quality with these two books. In the first section of the first book, it mentions Sonic smiling twice in the same paragraph, which means either that the editor was asleep or Sonic has two mouths. Plus there's this part where they just forget to supply you with a combat stat, so you really have no idea what to do. I just took it as a free win from the writer since the editor had fallen back to sleep. There's also no fourth wall breaking, which is something that happened a fair bit in the first two books, and I really enjoyed it there. The plot of Sonic v Zonic involves a metal clone of Sonic, which has clearly been created by Robotnik. All of Sonic's friends, including Tails, are scared or annoyed at him for being a dick, despite the fact that the cover makes them look clearly different. Sonic goes on an adventure to take care of this imposter, We are perfectly matched, completely identical in every way, and eventually finds and destroys the factory making these robot clones. Mechanically, we've gone back to having only stats for Sonic, with Tails providing a small bonus to combat but he's not really necessary. Sonic v Zonic, man that's a fucking hard title to say. There's a lot less bite than the first two game books had. It's really easy to get through even if you are a small child. I, I assume not being a small child, I probably can't actually tell that. That doesn't mean it's all roses and sunshine though. There are a lot of arbitrary fuck you moments in this book. Half the time your decisions seem completely random. And if you don't have the right items or enough rings by the end of the book, you have no way of winning at all. There's also a couple of signs of bad design. On entry 253, you have two options, checking out a lever or helping Tails. If you pick the Tails option, you are immediately redirected back to the lever entry instead. In fairness, this isn't that uncommon in game books, and it even happens in the first two. But it was disguised a lot better, having usually at least two entries between the redirect, so the players don't necessarily notice they're being railroaded into certain choices. There are a few cool moments though, such as smashing up the factory towards the end, which is really satisfying, and that time that you meet the rat cult living in the sewers, which is a thing on Mobius I guess. Having said that, the ending is completely underwhelming. It's only a few sentences long and it doesn't even end with a killer party or a giant robot battle like the first two did. On the plus side, there are a lot more references to the second game in this one, which makes sense considering that the first two books were released before the second game was even out. The artwork for Sonic v Zonic is passable, but there's something really weird going on with Tails' face on this cover. Plus, there's no ending artwork at all, and the checkpoint system that made the first two game books feel a lot fairer is just gone. The other book by Gross and Sutherland is called The Zone Zapper, and it fares slightly better than Sonic v Zonic, although there are still errors, such as in Entry 36, where they don't tell you what stat to use again, and in various entries the book just seems to forget about things, like this monitor I was supposed to be looking at on entry 202. The plot this time is pretty basic. Robotnik is trying to take over Mobius, again, and to do so he has an evilifying ray. At the start of the book he zaps Tails, so Sonic has to go around visiting zones from Sonic 2, collecting emeralds and defeating Robotnik again at the end. In a way it almost feels formulaic, but it's also the book that feels closest to the actual Sonic games, which is pretty cool. Luckily, the checkpoint system makes a comeback, which is quite welcome, and the skill checks feel more balanced than the first three books. 
One of the coolest plot elements is the fact that you're joined by a bad Nick who has been hit by the evil Flying Grey, and has been turned into a... good Nick, I suppose. It's a nice touch having this bad Nick follow you on your adventure, and a lot of the choices are to do with whether you should trust your companion or not. There's also a lot of choices based around choosing whether your new friend should do something or Sonic should, based on deciding which skill set is most useful. The only odd thing about this guy is that he actually eats other bad Nicks at one point. Oh, I don't even know how it works. I mean, bad Nicks are just robots with animals trapped inside them, so does he even have a digestion? If he eats the robot, does he also eat the small animal that's trapped inside? Come to think of it, actually, the bad Nicks that he eats are like wisps, those little things from the uh, Aquatic Rune Zone. But they're small as shit, do they even have anything in them? Oh, uh, this is a tangent, isn't it? Yeah, sorry viewer, back to it. None of the moments during the main part of this book particularly stand out or anything, so it's probably the least memorable of all of the books. Other than that whole, you know, working with a bad Nick aspect. Luckily, the ending this time is way cooler than the last book. Not only does the artwork make a comeback, but you actually get some resolution with the bad Nick once he's been turned evil again, which doesn't really make sense, but it's completely awesome as far as I'm concerned. Speaking of artwork, it's a bit odd this time. Robotnik is probably the worst victim. His cover appearance is fine if a bit weird, but in the book, I actually think he's trying to eat me. Seriously, what the hell happened here? Did the person drawing this art have any idea what Robotnik was supposed to look like? Did they lose feeling in their arm while they were drawing and just decide to go with it? I have no idea what I'm even looking at here. The last book I have access to is Theme Park Panic, because the last one is too damn expensive. As well as being the last one I have to cover, it's also the shortest. I mean, just look how thin it is compared to the other four. This is also the first book to include Amy, directly using her appearance from Sonic CD by the look of her design on the cover. This adventure was written by Mark Gascoigne and Jonathan Green, and once again the style takes a pretty radical shift. The fourth wall breaking has made a comeback with a vengeance, and it really is a welcome addition. Mechanically, it's pretty much the same as the others, with the same stat selection, item collection, and ring slash live system. The plot this time round deals with Sonic basically being dragged to a brand new theme park that has opened on Mobius. When he gets there, he discovers that the whole place has been taken over by Robotnik. Again. So he has to save his friends and try to rescue the theme park for the owner. You journey through various attractions to try and get to the end and beat the final fight. You've got a haunted house, a medieval village, a western area, and even a pirate adventure. The last one of those gives you the greatest piece of art in the history of Sonic. Pirate Sonic. This is definitely the toughest bug in the series so far too. There are a lot of Roller 10 challenges, which are almost impossible to beat unless you either cheat or know what challenges are coming up. I had to restart pretty early because I came up against the Grim Reaper. Oh, uh, spoiler alert, the Grim Reaper's in this book. You have to fight this fucker at the end of the Haunted House segment, but like all of the Roller 10 challenges, you need to have put a 4 or a 5 into Strength, the stat that is used for this fight. The problem is, is that the different stat usage is way more balanced, so the chances that you've made Strength one of your top picks is pretty effing slim. Unfortunately, the checkpoint system isn't used either, so it's not like you get another crack at the lead-up to give you more of a chance to avoid the game over, or just avoid the fight entirely. There are some cool parts of this book though. The items in this adventure actually have multiple uses. You can pick them up and choose to use them in various locations for different effects. The only slight pisser here is that certain items are basically a requirement to beat the final boss fight. Obviously, on your first run through the game, you're not going to know which items you'll need to keep and which is okay to use. So you might get to the end and just find it impossible to finish the damn thing. It's a shame too, because the final boss is awesome thematically. It's actually another giant robot fight, although this time it's giant robot Sonic versus a robot Tyrannosaurus Rex. And if you manage to beat the book, Sonic takes most of the credit, but he acknowledges your presence, which is pretty rad, and then walks off in the giant robot version of himself. It's also pretty fun that Sonic is in full, ooh, girls have cooties mode whenever Amy is around. Once again, for the most part, the art here is pretty cool, although I don't know why Sonic looks like a reverse blue Christmas tree. The art in the books almost always looks like actual Sonic, especially if you colour it in, which I didn't spend two hours doing. What do I look like an insane person? I really don't know what happened with some of this cover art. At least we managed to avoid any nightmare fuel Robotnik this time round. Although it's a shame that we didn't get any artwork of this cockney robot with a felt dip pen moustache. If I had any talent, I may have tried to recreate it myself, but here we are. As I mentioned before, my favourite art is this piece where Sonic is dressed as a pirate, opening a treasure chest. I'd totally have this as a poster if I could. There's also this piece with giant Robo Sonic, who's pretty awesome as well. 
All in all, these game books are a lot of fun. I'd probably say the one and two are the best. And no, I'm not just saying that because James Wallace agreed to be in my video. If you're going to try these out, I highly recommend getting these first two. If you're a fan of the UK-based Sonic canon from the 90s, then these two are effectively the basis for it. They came out before the novels did, and they're easy to get. Hell, if you're into game books based on video games at all, then you should try out this series. It's really cool. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go and complete my collection. Mm. Do you guys have any idea how much a kidney goes for these days? Thank you to everyone for watching, and a massive thank you to James Wallace for recording some audio clips for me. You can go to my second channel if you like, and I'll have uploaded the entirety of the audio he recorded for you to listen to. He talks a bit more about the novels he wrote as well, which is an additional bonus. I'm also thinking of doing a twine version of these game books, the Sonic ones, like I did with the first Goosebumps book. If anyone has any scans of the last book in the series they could send to me, that would be really helpful. I want to try and archive it so that people can access it without having to remortgage their home. If you enjoyed my review, please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. It really, really does help us out, especially right now. Also, if you really liked it, you can actually support us on Patreon, which is a thing we have now. It would really help me out with future production if I was able to financially commit more time to these videos. I might even be able to make more than one a month. Fucking chair click. Thanks again. Now, back to browsing eBay for someone who doesn't know the value of what they're selling.